Thank you, Ken. This, the year 2020 is the 75th anniversary of the formation of the United Nations. Yesterday was United Nations Day. The Unitarian Universalist Association suggests that all congregations celebrate the United Nations by setting aside one Sunday in the year to acknowledge the organization's work. To this end, they have supplied materials on the UUA website, which I will be using extensively today for our United Nations Sunday. When I was in high school in South Africa, we did a unit in social studies on the United Nations, and we were examined on the different branches and how they functioned and worked together. When my first husband, Andy Norville, was a scientist in Zimbabwe, he worked for the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, which is a specialized agency of the United Nations. They sent him to many places, including Burundi and Cuba. They also paid him very, very well. And so when we came to America in 1990, we had enough forex or foreign currency as it was known, American dollars, to put down a deposit on a house in Florida. And we were very fortunate indeed in that because most, well, Zimbabweans by law could only take a thousand dollars out of the country per family if they immigrated. So I've always had an interest in the United Nations and the work that it does. Until recently, I was unaware that Unitarian Universalists actually have their own working group called UU at UN. The Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations was created in 1962. The United States Ambassador to the United Nations was Adlai Stevenson, who was a Unitarian. He advocated for the creation of this organization. From leading the Faith Caucus to establish the International Criminal Court to overcoming United Nations apathy about sexual orientation and gender issues, the UU at UN has a long history of providing strong leadership in all aspects of human rights through United Nations consultative status. And now Matt will read our call to worship. This is a poem by Alicia Ford called When We Pause to Remember. When we pause to remember who we are, companions on this grand experiment called life, when we take a moment to shed the ways we have been carefully taught, to lead from fear, to punish the poor, to persecute those who don't look like we do, to deny rights to those who love, to believe that we are separate, that some people are superior to others. When we take a moment to shed all of that and hear our stories, hear and see each other into existence, into community, when we take a moment to embrace, to practice a different way of being, when we answer the call of love, then we are living into the promise of building the world we dream about. It is beautiful to dream, to cast a vision, to stretch our minds into the future and imagine what we may be if we were to build a new way of being, not someday, but beginning again today, beginning again every day that we have breath, taking courage with these hands and hearts to make real the dream of a more equitable world, to journey together, seeking to be transformed, even as we transform, becoming explorers and learners in this world around us, humbled by what we do not yet know, fulfilling the promise of healing a fragmented world, laboring not just in hope, but also in love. In this spirit we commit, in this spirit we pray, in the spirit we gather. Thank you, Matt. 
We light our chalice today with the words of the Charter of the United Nations. This can be found in our hymnal, Seeing the Living Tradition, number 475. You can follow along in your hymnal if you have one. I have asked Athena to read for us. All right. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom, and for these ends, to practice tolerance and to live together in peace as good neighbors, to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security, to ensure that armed force shall not be used save in the common interest, to employ international machinery in the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all people, have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims. This is a charter of the United Nations. Our opening hymn this morning is number 163 in the hymnal, uh, For the Earth Forever Turning. Uh, we remind you that uh, if you plan to sing along, uh, or even if you don't, uh, please make sure that you're muted uh, so that, uh, that the music isn't interrupted. Thank you. would like to introduce a brief video representing what we did for our peace pole planting ceremony and um, through um, the, the, the connection with the United Nations there are many people who are um, affiliated with the United Nations who are also affiliated with peace poles and how we came to receive our peace pole was through a person who was connected through the United Nations at the May Peace Prevail on Earth um, International. And so I just wanted to introduce that and I'm going to share a video where Ken will share um, what he, how he um, honored the Peace Poll and shares a little bit of history about Peace Fellowship. Uh, 
our founding mothers, who included, among others, Sue Hansen, Abby Majeska, Sue Timmons, and Loretta Mershon, established Peace Fellowship 17 years ago with a mission to create a supportive religious community that serves as an active, living, positive force for social action in the larger community in which we all live. And in recognition of those 17 years of our existence, I have placed in a circle around the pole here 17 stones, uh, which are from the, the the same batch for which you know we, we use to to populate our uh, memorial garden in the back of the church, and echoing our tradition of placing stones in our chalice on Sunday morning uh, during joys and concerns. Our name is often misspelled, failing to recognize that peace is an acronym for peace, education, action, community, and environment. Because without all of these, there will be no lasting peace. Now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Elizabeth Norville. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all so much. We would now like to invite members of the UU Peace Fellowship to come forth and place a stone at the base of our peace pole. And uh, we welcome you to Raleigh, North Carolina, and thank you so much. May peace prevail on earth. Everyone. May peace prevail on earth. Let's say it again. May peace prevail on earth. Peace prevail on earth. Beautiful. May peace prevail on earth. Thank you, everyone. That was September 26th, um, just a month ago. Hard to believe how quickly that time has gone. And today, I wish everyone a blessed United Nations Day, which was actually yesterday, but we'll celebrate this weekend and grateful for this service today. And now we come to a time in our service where we honor our week with each other. Our meditation hymn this morning is in your hymnal number 402 in the gray hymnal. From you I receive. Please make sure that you are muted if you wish to sing along. More information about the United Nations. With a scourge of war heavy on hearts and minds following World War II, 51 countries met in San Francisco to create the United Nations, where they drafted and signed its charter. 
When these 51 countries signed the Charter on the 24th of October 1945, they became member states of the United Nations and committed their governments and peoples to maintain international peace and security, as well as to the Charter's other purposes and principles. When states become member of the United Nations, they agree to accept the many obligations of the United Nations Charter. Much of the UN's work sets normative frameworks that governments must take upon themselves to implement. The fourth purpose listed in the Charter is particularly illustrative of the UN's mission to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. A common misunderstanding is that the United Nations is a director of action or change, or that it has power over states. Much like how our, our elected or appointed officials in a city or province draft legislation in the interests of their local constituents, UN delegates from different countries deliberate about law and legislation at the international level. Governments draft, debate and vote for or against treaties, conventions or actions plans discussed at the UN. Then it is necessary for the individual countries that sign these conventions to ensure that they are followed through and for civil society to hold our own countries accountable for the commitments they make. There are now 193 member states in the United Nations. In addition, the Holy See and the state of Palestine have observer status, meaning that they have speaking rights, but no voting rights. Working with such a diversity of peoples requires a large full-time translation team. The UN works in six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. And now Becky will cue us a video about the formation of the United Nations, which I, I found kind of historically interesting with all um, the people smoking. But there's... When the conference convened, Franklin Roosevelt was missing. The man who helped weld the United Nations together as a fighting team and who worked to keep them united in the peace to come had died before he could see his dream come true. But his words were in every mind and heart. 25 years ago, American fighting men looked to the statesmen of the world to furnish the work of peace for which they fought and suffered, we failed them. We failed them then, we cannot fail them again and expect the world to survive again. President Truman, Roosevelt's friend and successor, opened the conference by radio from Washington relevance to the United Nations Conference on International Organization. It is not the purpose of this conference to draft a treaty of peace in the old sense of that term. This conference will devote its energies and its labors exclusively to the single problem of setting up the essential organization to keep the peace. You are to write the fundamental charter. As the delegates broke up that first night, the task before them was clear, to chart the course toward realistic international cooperation to preserve peace. This was the responsibility vested in them by a war-weary world. It was for this they had gathered 
at the invitation of the governments of China, Great Britain, the USSR, and the United States. This was the step made possible by Dunkirk and Stalingrad and Normandy and the Burma Road and Midway, planned for at Casablanca, Cairo, Moscow, Tehran, Dumbarton Oaks, and Yalta. Delegates from 46 and later 50 nations were there, but there in spirit, too, were the victims of Warsaw, Coventry, Shanghai, Lidice. The hopes of the living and the dead were concentrated in the hands of the representatives meeting at San Francisco. Together they organized the huge problem ahead of them. The discussion and amendment of the proposals prepared at Dumbarton Oaks. Each nation was represented on all four large commissions, set up to work out the general provisions of the United Nations Charter and the actual structure of the General Assembly, Security Council, and Judicial Organization. These committees were divided into smaller working groups, 12 in all. Chinese, English, Russian, French, and Spanish were the standard means of exchange among many languages spoken. And in nine weeks, the charter was ready to go before the participating governments for ratification. In the General Assembly of the United Nations Organization, each member will have one vote. Any matters within the scope of the charter will be discussed here. Recommendations will be made to the Security Council. The Security Council will have five permanent members and six others elected by the General Assembly for two years. It is to be the enforcement arm of the organization. An international court of justice in permanent session will decide legal aspects of international disputes. The Economic and Social Council will have 18 members elected by the General Assembly. Special agencies like the Food and Agriculture Organization will be affiliated with it. The Trusteeship Council for the Advancement of Territories Held in Trust will be part of the General Assembly. It will be equally divided between those nations which administer trust territories and those which do not. There will be a secretariat to do the administrative work of the organization. These provisions... Some more information about the United Nations. With the scourge of war, oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> there are four main purposes for which the United Nations was created and continues to work. Number one, to maintain international peace and security. And to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace. Two, to develop friendly relations among nations based on the respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. Three, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic social, cultural, or humanitarian character, and in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. Four, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. And now we'll show you a video called Fanfare for All Peoples. <laughs> Oh, 
We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, que dos veces durante nuestra vida ha infligido a la humanidad sufrimientos indecibles. وأن نؤكد من جديد إيماننا بالحقوق الأساسية للإنسان وبكرامة الفرد وقدره وبما للرجال والنساء والأمم كبيرها وصغيرها من حقوق متساوية. À favoriser le progrès social et instaurer de meilleures conditions de vie dans une liberté plus grande. وأن نضم قوانا كي نحتفظ بالسلم والأمن الدولي. Accepter des principes et instituer des méthodes garantissant qu'il ne sera pas fait usage de la force des armes sauf dans l'intérêt commun. 运用国际机构，以促成全球人民经济及社会之进展。Решили объединить наши усилия для достижения этих целей. Accordingly, our respective governments, through representatives assembled in the city of San Francisco, que han exhibido sus plenos poderes encontrados en buena y debida forma, قد ارتضت ميثاق الأمم المتحدة هذا. and to hereby establish an international organization to be known as the United Nations. Long live the United Nations. Okay, good morning. Climate Justice and the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2015, the UN General Assembly adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which included 17 sustainable development goals to achieve by the target year of 2030. The introduction of the 2030 Agenda includes the ambitious pledge, quote, that no one will be left behind and we will endeavor to reach the furthest behind first." End quote. Although it has its own goal, Sustainable Development Goal 13, climate action is integral to all dimensions of inclusive sustainable development. In short, all the sustainable development goals depend on the achievement of Goal 13 and vice versa. It is our responsibility as Unitarian Universalists and global citizens to take action to ensure that climate change adaptation policies are responsive to ending poverty, Sustainable Development Goal 1, ensuring good health, Sustainable Development Goal 3, decent work for all, Sustainable Development Goal 8, and increasing access to justice and accountable institutions. Sustainable Development Goal 16. The following are the goals that relate, and these goals are going to be read by Colin, Leela, and Corinne. Goal number six, ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. So much of conversation about climate justice has to do with water. Communities are facing too much water, flooding, and others too, too little water, drought and still others are finding their water sources are contain contaminated either by pollution, contaminated pipes, or salt from rising oceans. Climate justice demands equi equitable and sustainable management of water sources and systems. Indigenous communities 
rights to protect their territorial land and waterways must be respected and fulfilled. Goal 12, ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. One target of Goal 12 points to the sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources. Creating climate justice means reassessing who has access and, to and ownership over the natural resources that serve as the basis of global economics. Another target calls for the sustainable management of chemical and other hazardous waste. Creating climate justice means responding to the needs of neighborhoods and communities whose air, water, and land have been contaminated with the improper disposal of chemical and other hazardous waste. Yet another target of the Sustainable Development Goal calls for a substantial reduction in waste generation through prevention, reduction, reuse, and recycling. Creating climate justice requires systematic changes throughout supply and consumption chains to prevent waste generation, reduce it when prevention is not possible, reuse materials in creative ways, and recycle whatever cannot be reproduced. Goal 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. It goes without saying combating climate change and its impacts is essential to creating climate justice. The first target of this goal calls on all countries to create and implement disaster risk reduction strategies. Although it is not part of the language in this specific goal, here, is it, here it is essential to remember the words from the introduction of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which stresses that in working to achieve the SDGs, countries pledge to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest behind first. When nations and local community communities are working to develop climate change mitigation, adaption, impact reduction, and early warning systems, it is absolutely essential that all parts of the community be part of the process. Every group that is traditionally excluded from decision making, for example, indigenous people, people with disabilities, youth, people of color, LGBTQ plus communities, and all other marginalized groups, Everyone must per participate in order to create solutions that will be effective and will work for everyone. Thanks very much for some great reading. Unitarian Universalists are bold leaders in action for social justice around the world. In our daily lives, we strive to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Each day at the United Nations, the Unitarian Universalist Office at the United Nations, UU at UN, strives to affirm and promote every person's human rights on the international stage. The UU at UN participates in meetings, conferences, and committees at the United Nations with member state representatives and key United Nations bodies, such as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Department of Global Communications, the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs, the United Nations Development Program, and more, to discuss with them how they can act in the interest of creating a world community that is accepting just and compassionate. For a non-governmental organization to have any influence at the United Nations, it must be accredited through the United Nations system. The UU at UN has two types of accreditation which allow us to do our work. It is important for Unitarian Universalists to have a strong presence at the United Nations to help shift global policy towards peace, justice, and liberation for all. We at Peace Fellowship can assist by making individual contributions to this organization. Peace Fellowship is hoping to become one of the six principal congregations that help sustain the crucial work of the UU at UN into the future. 
To do this, we have to fulfill certain criteria to qualify. One of the criteria is to have a United Nations Day service, which is what we're doing right now. Another task is to have a study group. Another is to contribute money from the congregation as a whole, which we are doing. Yet another is to have members contribute as individuals and become supporters. I hope you will be, consider becoming a supporter so that we can put Peace Fellowship on the map. Here is a video to explain further, and there will be more details in the upcoming newsletter. And I'm going to play this video and then afterwards I'm going to play a video from a contact explaining a little bit more about our connection to the United Nations from the UUA. So before our closing hymn, we'll do these two videos. At a time when nationalism is so dominant around the world, having a Unitarian Universalist voice represented at the United Nations is more critical than ever. The Unitarian Universalist Association Office of the United Nations has held a prominent place at the UN since 1962, advocating for UU values on the global stage. By engaging every day with member states and agencies, and speaking out in defense of human rights for those who are oppressed, the UU office has become a force to be reckoned with at the UN. The UU at UN's advocacy and coalition building helped to make sexual orientation and gender identity human rights a priority throughout the UN system. And we continue to be a leader on sexual orientation and gender identity issues within the UN human rights community. This year, our office is focused on bringing the global community together to share solutions for demilitarizing local police forces and to amplify just and inclusive ways to keep communities safe. Through our affiliation with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UU Office at the UN gets credentials for observers to represent Unitarian Universalists and participate in the annual UN climate conferences. In recent years, we have prioritized getting passes for Indigenous and frontline climate activists who are so often excluded from these intergovernmental conferences. We know that the international community must come together to solve global problems like climate change, but that governments aren't necessarily the ones who have the right solutions. Solutions need to come from communities that are most impacted by the changing climate. And the UUA office at the UN is proud to help representatives of these communities get to international gatherings so that their perspectives can be heard at the decision-making tables. None of this work would be possible without the generous support of Unitarian Universalists. Right now, those who represent the United States at the UN are working hard to destroy protections for human rights, for the environment, and for global cooperation. Make sure that you still have someone at the UN who's committed to upholding your values and interests. The UU office at the UN relies on congregational and individual donations to continue its work advocating for a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Please donate generously now to help our office maintain this important presence at the UN. If at least 5% of this congregation's members donate at a supporter level of $60 or more, you are on your way to achieving the 6th Principal Congregation Award. You can donate through text or online. To give by mobile phone, simply text UN Sunday to 51555. To give online, go to giving.uua.org slash uu at un. Thank you so much for your generosity. Your gifts can truly have a global impact.
Well, Becky, what an honor to be invited to you, 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 you meeting. Um, I have had the d incredible pleasure and of learning and working with Bruce Knox, the uh, UU representative to the United Nations. He is a wonderful colleague and um, I think it's a good place to start at where your office is because your office at the UN is in the church center and the church center is directly across the street from the United Nations headquarters in New York. And it is filled with individual um, denominations and NGOs who are working um, to, to making a better world and our NGOs at the UN. And the Unitarian um, Universalist office is there and it's headed by Bruce um, who um, has recently been the president of the Committee of Religious NGOs and has been incredibly active in disarmament. And he is the chair of the disarmament um, NGO committee meeting. So I just want to say hello to your congregation, to thank you for the work and support that you give to the UN, and also to invite you to participate with the UN with your prayers today for the 75th anniversary. And uh, there are a few things that I do. I and my name is Monica Lillard, and I represent the United Religions Initiative at the UN. And Bruce actually said, I probably get more people to pray than most anyone else at the UN, um, because I feel that it is my job to add spirit to many of the issues. Uh, I have had the good fortune of working with the Department of Public Information since 1997 on the International Day of Peace, which is September 21st. Um, and then there are other UN days and weeks and um, years. And uh, much, much of what I bring to my organization, which is in 108 countries um, with cooperation circles, it's an interfaith organization, it's a bridge building organization. And um, we look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm uh, very well, uh, I'm just so excited that you are using three of them today. And I would just like to add um, the idea that all of these goals, which I'm sure you'll see this little um, description of the goals, um, each one needs action, it needs prayers, and it needs you to take it into your heart because it is a transformative agenda. And this is the decade for action for the Sustainable Development Goals. So thank you for celebrating the 75th anniversary. And I just have to mention a couple of other things that I think bring out the heart and the direction for the UN. And one is the charter. The charter was signed on June 26, 1945. And the United Religions Initiative signed our charter on June 26 of um, 2000. And so we share the charter signing day and it was signed in San Francisco, which is where we are headquartered. But most importantly, the charter just sets the principles and the goals of this organization. And as with many organizations, the goals are set at a higher bar. It gives you something to work to attain. And I invite you to look at the UN Charter, particularly the preamble, and use that as you put the sustainable development goals into your heart into your prayers and into actions because you're already doing them. And so I God bless and may peace prevail on them. Grateful for Monica Willard at the United Religions Initiative for sharing some more history of our connection. Ooh, I'm bending down to my microphone um, for our connection for UUA with um, the United Nations. And um, we will have more information. We might see if we can order some of those bookmarks uh, to share with, with each of us. And um, thank you. And now, Elizabeth, am I now sharing our closing hymn? Well, perhaps uh, if you if you can uh, uh, give me just a second. Uh, if you intend to be a supporter and use one of the electronic means that uh, that was was mentioned, the either going online and, and donating, uh, please let Elizabeth know uh, that you have chosen to do that, so that uh, we can include your name on the list of supporting donors uh, uh, that are members of uh, Peace Fellowship. 
Uh, if, on the other hand, you would like to be a, to join Elizabeth and I as supporting donors uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, if you wish to send a check, uh, uh, make it payable, please, to UUPF, and on the memo line indicate United Nations, and I will bundle them and send them all as a single check uh, from, uh, from Peace Fellowship. And I'd like to add that the good news is if you are a retired person, your contribution only needs to be $30 in order for you to qualify as one of the 5% of the congregation. So that's kind of encouraging. They said $60, but $30 would have uh, go towards having us recognized as a sixth principal congregation. And at the moment, there are no other North Carolina congregations um, registered on this site. So uh, we would be a first, and I think that's worth doing. Thank you. Now our closing hymn from the uh, Singing the Living Tradition, or Teal Hymnal, number 1074, is Turn the World Around performed by the Community Church Choir from Chapel Hill. We come from the fire, living in the fire, go back to the fire, turn the world around. We come from the water, living in the water, go back to the water, turn the world around. We come from the mountain, closing words. You need to unmute Athena. Okay. This is a short poem by Tanya Marquez. Do not fear agitation, for agitation is the rhythm of life itself to be put into motion, to be stirred. Do not fear the movements that decenter what you always thought permanent. You carry within the center of your understanding the compass to show you the way. Carry with you the love that will hold you, the vision that will guide you, the relationships to all beings, and the world that will ground you. Go in peace, 
and in gentle agitation to stir this world to the side of love.